My name is Jennifer Smith and I'm with Wisconsin Sea Grant as a science communicator and welcome to our first uh, Encore Lake Talk of the spring season. As some of you know, the session that we had a few days ago, about a week and a half ago, had some technical difficulties. So Tim has kindly volunteered to redo this session today. So we're glad you can be here with us online. Um, and I'll just start off with a few announcements. We have one hour and that includes time for your questions. When we get to that point, uh, please enter your question through the, the chat function at the bottom of the screen. You don't actually have to wait until Tim is done. You can enter them at any time and then we'll just jump right into those questions um, once Tim is done with the main part of his presentation. Um, also, this session is being recorded so you can watch it later, you can share it with other people. Um, once we have it ready, we'll put the recording on the YouTube channel for Wisconsin Sea Grant and it will be captioned on there. Um, one other quick thing that I'd like to mention is that looking ahead, the next talk in this Lake Talk series will be on April 15th, and that one will be Dr. Sarah Balgoyan, and she'll be talking about PFAS in the Green Bay watershed. Um, she is a fellow with Wisconsin Sea Grant doing a two-year postdoc fellowship. Um, then just one last thing I want to say before we get started, uh, just a few words about our speaker, Tim Campbell. Um, Tim Campbell of Wisconsin Sea Grant holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame and a master's from Oakland University. Um, in his position with Sea Grant, he works with a wide range of communities, organizations, local governments, and other stakeholders to help people take action to prevent the spread of AIS. And now, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Tim. Great. Thanks, Jen. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for round two of this presentation. I hope there's a few people uh, checking it out a second time, because that's how awesome it was the first time. Uh, so if you're that person, thank you for joining us. Um, but I'm excited to get to share this uh, with everyone again. Um, well, probably not again. <laughs> but uh, this is a project that's been a lot of fun uh, for me and my co-authors. And I am going to uh, quickly share my screen. Um, hey, Jen, can you uh, give me permission to share my screen? Okay, excellent. And Okay, hey, Jen, can you just confirm that my screen looks good? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> so um, again, this project's been a lot of fun and uh, calling it what cartoon zebra mussels taught me about invasive species communication, but I think really it could be just more generally on how um, creative applications of, uh, you know, I guess science and, uh, you know, combining science and art uh, to learn a little bit more about communications and how that's kind of, I think, moved me forward in some of my outreach work. So, uh, of course, I'm Tim Campbell with Wisconsin Sea Grant, uh, and I've, well, and then my co-authors are Dr. Brett Shaw, which some of you may know. He's from the UW Madison uh, Department of Life Science Communications, as well as uh, the UW Division of Extension NRI, and as well as Dr. Barry Radler, who. Uh, helped us out with some of the statistical components of our project. So I think you know, to just kind of get started, um, a lot of this work really came from uh, kind of the question, how should we talk about invasions? And you know, this is, I've heard a lot of different people have different opinions on this, that we shouldn't use some metaphors, we should use this approach. Some people uh, really latch on to certain things. Uh, for example, you know, like fighting the war on invaders or the war on invasive species, or even you know, like the Wisconsin Invasive Species Council Invader Crusader Award, you know, that, that, that militaristic metaphor that it's this kind of all hands on deck <laughs> effort against uh, this common enemy. But you know, there's, there's, I think, some ethical issues with this. Um, you know, are we really at war with another species? You know, is this metaphor fair to people that actually have been to war? Because I'm not sure they're quite the same. Um, so while it might it might be effective at getting people to take action against invasive species, you know, are there unintended consequences to using this metaphor? 
you know, kind of at the complete other end of the spectrum, we have people advocating for very neutral language about invasive species. So like, oh, this is a stage AB 27 invasion where you like get your handy dandy flip chart out and you can kind of calculate you know, what the population levels are and impacts are based off of that number. Like that literally means nothing without uh, kind of a chart to help decode it. So that's the complete other end, which you know, I think that could be really objective and not have unintended consequences, but it could also be very tough to understand. And then of course we have our, you know, our hitchhiker metaphor, stop aquatic hitchhikers, you know, the well, well-known prevention brand that uh, a lot of people uh, are aware of, you know, thanks to its prominent placement everywhere. So I wanna talk all about that. It's gonna be fun, but uh, I do wanna to try to have a little bit more of an interactive presentation. And so I don't know if people have used poll everywhere before. If you go to the top of the screen, uh, pollev.com, Tim Campbell 536, uh, you can uh, vote in this poll. So this right now is not really that important, but an opportunity for you to navigate to the website and kind of figure out how this works. So just want to know where uh, everyone tuning is is from, where you currently live, Wisconsin, not Wisconsin, or there are other places, sorry, there are places other than Wisconsin worth living. So I'll give people uh, a few seconds to fill out this poll and then we'll uh, continue on. I think me personally, if I were voting, I'd probably uh, select C. <laughs> um, but it looks like we have uh, a lot of folks from Wisconsin on today, which is great. Um, probably because one of the only places it got sent out was our AIS list, but um, glad that you all could join us. So I am going to go, um, looks like some people might be having some issues with the poll, um, but we have somebody not from Wisconsin with us today, <laughs> which is great. So we'll move forward and try the next one. So um, the next slide is a, a little bit of a background on invasive species. So I could take as much time or as little time as we need here, um, but I will take less time if people already know a lot about invasive species. So you got a, looks like we have a little bit of a range of um, invasive species knowledge on the call. We have some professionals and we have uh, some professionals. I know a lot, I know some. So good to hear people are already uh, kind of on board with invasive species and know a little bit. So I won't be spending too much time on this introduction <laughs> to AIS in the Great Lakes. Uh, as you probably know, there are a lot of non-native species in the Great Lakes, I think 186 uh, by last count. And so notice I said non-native, not invasive, because not all non-native species are invasive. Um, an invasive species is a non-native species that causes ecological harm, economic harm, or harm to human health. So uh, if you can squint really hard and look at some of these small pictures, you know, kind of up at the top, you'll see uh, some of our like coho salmon, um, like Chinook salmon. So you'll see some of our more economically valuable non-native species in the Great Lakes uh, that you know, are kind of the basis of our four to $7 billion recreational fishery. But then you'll see some invasive species. Uh, our snails are pretty easy to see at the bottom. Uh, there's round goby, round goby, there's some fish viruses too. So, so we have, sorry, lost my train of thought. <laughs> so while some of the non-native species are kind of valuable and we welcome them into the Great Lakes, there's plenty of them in the Great Lakes that uh, cause some sort of environmental harm or uh, ecological harm and thus are invasive. And so I think how we talk about them uh, matters and uh, I guess, Part of the reason why I wanted to stop and focus a little bit on the difference between non-native and invasive. So uh, before we really dive into the nerdy stuff, I'm going to uh, tell a little bit of a story and be a nerd in a different way <laughs> and talk about this really angry spiny water flea general and how it relates to our friend, or my friend and water librarian, Ann Mosher here at the uh, at Wisconsin Sea Grant. And so a project that uh, Brett Shaw and I worked on 
uh, almost well more than five years ago now. Uh, this is an idea that Brett had. You know, invasive species communication is kind of uh, one of Brett's specialties, and one thing that he was you know, really interested in was trying to communicate a complex invasive species problem. And at the time, the consensus for this was trying to talk about spiny water fleas because it wasn't um, you know, kind of a, as tangible of invasive species like Eurasian water milfoil or zebra mussels. Like you can you know, pick up or like see a dock or a boat that has a whole bunch of zebra mussels on it. You can see Eurasian water milfoil kind of matted on the top or tangled up in a, a boat prop. So those impacts are pretty easy to talk about. But some of the impacts of the spiny water flea, um, you know, it's this tiny little water flea that uh, you kind of have to, it's a kind of cascade of effects that get to something that's really impactful, like uh, you know, decreased water clarity in Lake Mendota and the costs that it would you know, take to re restore that water quality. So uh, Brett really wanted to try to make something to communicate about spiny water fleas in a fun and effective way. And that's where uh, I came in. I had this interest as well. I uh, thought that spiny water fleas would be a topic that we needed to talk about a little bit more. So we came up with this idea um, that you know kind of tied in with uh, you know different com uh, communication principles and theories and behavior change uh, theories to you know try to get people to think about spiny water fleas, learn about spiny water fleas, and take action. And so kind of our main challenge was you know can we make an educational video that you know, appeals to our target audience, is educational, and has viral social media qualities. Because we've both been a part of projects where uh, we spent a lot of resources to try to make you know, a really great video. We made a great video, and then like 300 people watched it. And so we wanted to make sure that you know, if we were producing something, that it was something that a lot of people would watch. And so part of the way we wanted to do this was uh, have some fun with the video, but also maybe have some kind of cultural references. So, and we also knew that our target audience for uh, boaters in Wisconsin, that uh, we send out a, a regular survey to boaters in Wisconsin and we ask uh, registered boaters for the primary boat user in the household <laughs> uh, to fill out the survey. And it's an overwhelmingly uh, older male audience. So, you know, we really kind of leaned into this militaristic metaphor and, we you know, copied a scene from Patton. Um, I've never seen Patton, but I knew the scene. I knew it was from Patton. <laughs> so we thought that this might appeal to some of our older audience and kind of maybe be uh, inspiring or like invoke some reactance theory and uh, you know, challenging this spiny water flea general. And then we got a little crazy at the end uh, and kind of borrowed from a Zoolander scene where Mugatu uh, tries to brainwash Derek Zoolander. Um, but this allowed us to repeat our message a lot, which I think uh, helped with some of the learning objectives. But we thought that you know this might appeal to some of our younger audience because it's just weird and crazy and weird and crazy things get shared on social media. So we thought that this might help with that. So unfortunately, we did not go viral. Uh, we have just under 7,000 views, which uh, isn't even the most viewed spiny water flea video on YouTube right now, which is a little bit of a bummer. <laughs> um, also like a hundred of those views are mine and then a few thousand of them are paid advertising. So um, we did not succeed at our primary goal. Uh, we did succeed at other things. Um, we compared this to just a more kind of traditional educational video on spiny water fleas and people uh, learned more by watching this video. They knew more about spiny water fleas after watching it and they uh, were able to repeat back to us some of the uh, the steps that they need to take to prevent the spread of water, spiny water fleas. So we thought that was good. Also, the resources spent across both videos were pretty similar. So um, this could be a justification for if you have a set amount of resources to make a video and uh, if you want to make a fun one, <laughs> that uh, you might have better learning objectives out of it uh, for the same price. So make a fun video if you can. Um, but anyway, so we didn't really meet our primary objective of going viral. And so, um, I did not clear this out. So uh, before we move on, I would be interested to know how the people in attendance, uh, how does the spiny water flea general make you feel, whether you've seen the stopthespiny.com video or not. Uh, be interested in seeing you know, how people felt about this.
so I like hilarious and entertained. That's uh, very much how Brett and I felt and <laughs> some of the other people we had on the video. Uh, we thought that it might make people feel stressed, funny. So um, these are all things that we were kind of going for. Um, we have heard weird, and maybe that's also the the Zoolander part of it. But uh, I think something else we maybe figured out that if things are a little too weird, like this video, uh, people might not share it. So you can't go overboard and indulge, uh, you know, kind of every great idea that you have <laughs> for this. So unfortunately, uh, as much as I like the Spiny Water Fleet General and thought it was a great idea, our water librarian, and um, you never want to upset your water librarian, uh, she did not like it. <laughs> and I feel like of all of the people uh, that did not like it and had the most almost like physical reaction to the video and not liking the Spiny Water Fleet General, which is definitely not what we were going for and didn't really anticipate that. And then uh, an additional friend and colleague from the Great Lakes Commission. Um, I hope she's like kind of joking, but within every joke, there's a little bit of truth. Uh, I don't think she was a huge fan of the Spiny Water Fleet General either. So that really, you know, I guess the thing that I really learned from this video um, is A, that it's harder to go viral than you think it is. And that, you know, these message frames for invasive species communications that we think might be really effective uh, might not be having the effects that we want. You know, we thought that this would be really entertaining. People would share it, have a good laugh and also learn about spiny water fleas. But there was a good number of our audience that just like did not like it <laughs> and didn't share it. And that's not really helpful to our efforts. So that's, you know, since this video came out and we saw some of the reactions from it, even though we were, you know, very specifically targeting um, kind of a male older audience, which seems to have liked the video, uh, other people have seen it. And it, I think has had a little bit of a, a negative effect or an unintended effect. So that's really kind of stuck with me. And really, I think driven home the idea that we don't really know how these invasive species message frames you know, impact our thoughts and actions. I think we have a lot of opinions on it and we're gonna go into a little bit of uh, Kind of the published literature that talks about this some more about you know kind of what some of the ethical arguments are but we don't really know it's a lot of kind of opinions and ethical arguments at this point or uh, that's what we think so there is some published literature on this uh, there is one study uh, that talks about describing invasive species as the driving force of environmental change rather than the passengers of environmental change, which are, you know, kind of two different ways you can think of invasive species that, you know, invasive species come into an area and cause environmental change versus invasive species are coming in after, you know, like humans degraded a system or um, there's some other environmental disturbance that opens up in, uh, environmental space for these species. And so when you talk about invasive species as the driving force, people are more, uh, uh, they're more willing to take action against the spread or take action against invasive species. So kind of one way to think about this is, you know, to maybe look at or talk about invasive species as like zebra mussels have come in and filtered the water so much that you know, the water's so clear, there's no food left. And you can see these shipwrecks, which is not something that uh, really happened, you know, pre zebra mussels that uh, the water was so clear that you got amazing photos like this, right? So this is kind of an instance where zebra mussels are the drivers of environmental change versus, um, you know, invasive species came in, be, you know, as passengers and ballast water and, you know, have then had impacts on the Great Lakes where really the frame is, you know, invasive species are a byproduct of what people do, which is, you know, 100% correct, um, but is less inspiring to people uh, for taking action. Even though, you know, for me, this is like very hopeful because if invasive species are moved around by people, uh, human behavior can change and then theoretically invasions are preventable if we can change people's behaviors. Uh, another study that's actually pretty similar to ours um, that was done, looked at different frames, uh, like you know, kind of a standard, just informational frame, one where you present the regulations about invasive species or talk about uh, descriptive norms or objective norms um, had an impact on what people uh, believed or their intended actions. So their intended actions, uh, people intended to take more action if presented you know, with the legal frame than the other ones, but the effect sizes on these weren't high. And then something that uh, Brett knows from some of his previous work is that when doing message tests like these, the visual is actually a very, uh, a very important part of this and actually 
drives more of what people think or feel about a certain message than the text. So if you're going to have a visual, um, you know, it's good that it's consistent here. So they're testing the, the text, not the, the visual, but the visual is actually uh, usually the driving force behind how people feel about something. So we wanted to be sure to capture that with what we did. So some other just kind of quick hits from the literature. So uh, maybe unsurprisingly, uh, the invasion literature uses more militaristic language than other sciences. And this is just like the count of words, not the percentage of articles that have this language in it. So just if you're counting uh, militaristic language, there's way more of it in invasion literature. And uh, you know, perhaps surprisingly, basic science journals actually use it more than some of the applied journals. Um, so this is maybe, um, you know, I guess people doing more applied management or applied work uh, are maybe a little bit more conscientious to uh, the language they're using than, um, you know, people doing more basic science. And then there's a, a really good kind of review article on de demilitarizing invasion biology that kind of lies out uh, some you know, ways that we could maybe less heavily rely on that uh, metaphor. And then uh, I guess the next paper I'll actually bring up here in a second is just really talking about responsible metaphor management, which is um, I think what we're really talking about. And what I like about how uh, this researcher pulled things together, um, you know, I think that she has, so, uh, ecologists often have a tendency to overlook the value dimensions of the terms they use. And, you know, invasion biology is a somewhat extreme example of that. And so that I think that could be you know, a reference to kind of that first uh, study I mentioned of um, invasion biology using this <laughs> uh, language a little bit more and that the the basic science journals having it more than the applied science journals that, you know, even scientists are a little bit biased <laughs> or uh, unaware of what they're doing. But then uh, the researcher argues then kind of at the end that, you know, instead of maybe trying to rid communications of metaphors and value laden language, which has real value because it helps people unfamiliar with, you know, our issues, you know, quickly relate it to something that they're more familiar with. Um, you know, we should just be more aware and kind of be more responsible users of metaphors. So kind of after that quick deep dive through the literature, so what message frames are actually like being used out in the real world? How are people communicating about invasive species? And so, um, you know, in my 10 years of doing this and Brett's, you know, 15 to 20, you know, like we've seen a lot of different things. And here's just a few subsets of some of the frames uh, that we've seen that, you know, we could easily get <laughs> if we did a Google search. But yeah, so here's some, militaristic frames that uh, are used and pretty easy to find on a Google image search, you know, kind of referring to invasive species as the enemy, you got the little like scope target, or the crosshairs there. Um, a lot of just the use of war or warrior, um, you know, and kind of, you know, showing this triumph over the enemy. So that's what a lot of kind of the militaristic imagery leans on. We also have nativist frames. Uh, Kind of invoke this feeling of the unwanted other you don't really belong here we don't want you um and just framing the invasive species as this like negative character bad guy um so if you are in wisconsin uh i was kind of bummed i couldn't find this picture but i, I have a picture of this costume uh emerald ash borer that you know, i think i'm like doing a double thumbs down with the emerald ash borer but there's a billboard near mount horeb on 151 if you're driving um, so maybe check that out sometime. But it, it's this really kind of nativist uh, emerald ash borer that the more I think about it, the more it kind of gives me the creeps, <laughs> probably like the spiny water flea general does to some people. So anyway, it's just trying to make you feel uncomfortable about these things and wanting to uh, get rid of them because of that. Here's our hitchhiker metaphor, you know, this kind of you know, invasive species are along for the ride, but you can stop them. And so people are really familiar with stop aquatic hitchhikers. Uh, something that you'll notice through our study is that um, while we use the hitchhiker metaphor is that like they're kind of along for the ride and you can stop them. Uh, we don't use stop aquatic hitchhikers because we did not want to test the brand of stop aquatic hitchhikers, which is well known throughout the country. We know that you know, people, even if they haven't seen it before, they know generally what it means and what they're supposed to do. So we didn't want to test that. We wanted to test the actual metaphor of hitchhiker. 
here's just an example of kind of scientific and fact-based communications uh, from a journal article that, you know, I did not dig into the methods to find out what these different scales mean, but without the rest of the paper, this doesn't really mean doesn't really mean that much. Or I guess, you know, had I put the figure caption here, that would have helped too. Uh, we also have kind of science or just the facts message frames, which uh, I don't have a great example of because, um, well, there's usually not <laughs> like nice appealing imagery for this, but, you know, we would say a science or just the facts uh, message frame is just, you know, a focus on the known impacts of invasive species, whether they impact fisheries, recreations, property value, water quality, and there's kind of no metaphor, no additional meeting. It's just straightforward message about invasive species. Um, that said, you know, it's kind of hard to find real world examples of, you know, like media without some metaphoric language and the word invasive has some kind of metaphorical meaning itself. And that's just something to be aware of. And this isn't a you know, specific message frame to invasive species, but really something kind of more broadly seen across environmental work is just this really protective message frame that, you know, there's this experience that you really like, um, you know, like walking out on the beach on the Lake Michigan or something like that. And that, you know, this is your place that you love and want to protect. And so by kind of tying into that sense of place and then saying, protect this from invasive species or marine debris or, you know, erosion, you know, kind of whatever environmental issue that you might be thinking about. Um, we often, or communicators will also often use this kind of protective frame to kind of tap into some motivation there. So after seeing all these, after reading the literature on, you know, some of the um, kind of the ethical and moral arguments for or against the use of uh, some message frames, you know, something we were really interested in is, you know, some data on how these message frames impact actions people might take. Because again, we've heard, you know, opinions and seen these arguments, but haven't really seen data on this. And knowing, um, you know, through some of our work on Facebook and other message tests, we thought there was some pretty inexpensive ways to actually get data on this to, you know, you know yeah, have data to make decisions. <laughs> so, uh, we came up with a project with some project goals to provide data on the impacts of difference in face of species message frames. Um, Facebook provided a great testing ground for this uh, just because it's kind of real world. Like people are just about their day on Facebook, you know, scrolling past cat videos or, you know, now uh, cargo or sorry, container ship memes. Um, but, you know, if you can get through all that, they might look at a zebra muscle <laughs> advertisement. And what we wanted to do was test which message frames are most effective at generating the lowest cost per click, but then also some of the other engagement met uh, metrics that Facebook tracks, like likes and shares. And then we wanted to compare metrics by gender. Um, you know, with that, we had kind of in mind, you know, Anne's <laughs> very uh, physical reaction reaction to the spiny water flea general, but also when we were field testing this, we also heard that, um, you know, from some people doing the pilot testing that there wasn't really a metaphor that really spoke to them. Um, and that tended to be more women saying that. So that really uh, encouraged us to put that kind of protective mes message frame in there to uh, uh, have something that was maybe a little well, less militaristic or nativist. So for operationalizing the frames, we tested five different message frames, the militaristic, nativist, hitchhiker, protective, and science. Um, as I mentioned, we know that the visuals have a greater impact than text. So we took a lot of effort to make sure that the visuals had a lot of uh, similar design elements, which you'll see in the next slide. But we worked with an artist. Uh, she was a graduate student at UW-Madison since uh, I don't think we could capture these with a photograph. So I feel like the only way we could have done this was uh, using drawings. Um, I think I mentioned this before, we you know, pilot tested this at the Wisconsin Fishing Expo. So we had, I think, uh, I think we had maybe 200 people look at all the different drawings. So uh, we got a lot of feedback to make sure that people kind of understood what they were looking at. And this whole process was a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, I'll encourage you if you ever have the chance to um, be creative and commission some drawings for research or for outreach. It was a lot of fun to try to bring these to life. And so uh, this is you know, one example of kind of the, the early drafts of our art. And I just wanna note that you know, this is kind of the care that 
our artist went through that Brooke went through to try to design these things. You know, just note that we had consistent font sizes. Uh, the drawings had consistent like, you know, visual weight of diagonal elements and all this kind of stuff, similar, similar color schemes. Because what we didn't want to have happen is, you know, having like a shiny color catch somebody's attention or just have it be some design element um, that caught somebody's attention versus the actual kind of like the actual metaphor feeling of the art. So, um, so yeah, I think this is just a good example of that. So I'm going to run through some of the, the drawings that we had for our project. And so we ran these as Facebook ads using the Facebook AB message test testing feature. And so within this, we have the drawing, which you can see here, this is the science or just impact based one, which is a, a boat prop with uh, zebra mussels attached to it. And then there's reinforcing text at the top. And then our action that we wanted people to take was to click to learn more, uh, to go to the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers website uh, to learn more about invasive species. So, um, so sorry, then here's our militaristic one, which yes, those are the boats they uh, make a marinette. <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. Uh, but we did have a few people like point that out in the comments, which I was pretty pleased about. But yeah, so this is stop the zebra mussel invasion. We have the reinforcing text kind of at the top and at the bottom here. Our nativist one that really kind of digs into that, well, not native, not welcome, kind of uncomfortable outsider feeling. Our protective one that you're kind of like, yes, you can do it. You can protect Wisconsin lakes. And here we're showing you how by picking the plants off and removing the zebra mussels. And then here's our hitchhiker metaphor about, you know, just stop zebra mussels from hitching a ride is kind of an accident. Uh, they can hurt your lakes, you know, like let's stop the spread. So how we tested this, we did five four day message tests consisting of $250 each for men and women. Um, we judged success mostly on cost per click, but then we have some of the other engagement me metrics as well. And then we reached 270,000 people, which uh, we thought was pretty good for the amount of money we spent. And um, if you kind of get into the statistics, now we have this set up. Our statistical tests are not very sensitive uh, because we don't have a high sample size, but with baked within all those samples, we actually reached a lot of people, which we think you know helps uh, apply some external validity to the project because there are a lot of people wrapped up into this project just uh, I guess our experimental design isn't particularly efficient. So um, for the testing I mentioned the Facebook AB message testing before so uh, within like a single kind of replicate all five metaphors are shown to the same population of people um, and so if you're shown one during a project period you can't be shown another one so and then we just repeated this uh, five times. And I think Facebook said that our total population of people was like 800,000. So we, you know, within Wisconsin, so we did not actually show this to all of the possible people that could see it in Wisconsin. Um, so here's another way to put our experimental design since uh, I've heard people say that it's confusing before. <laughs> so if you're more visual, this kind of helps show like exactly what we did at you know, each of our five time periods and the data we collected. Um, I can come back to this if people are interested in looking at it more. So before we go into the results, which message frame do people think is going to be the most engaging? Anyone wanna wager a guess? So hitchhikers and nativists at uh, early head starts. I don't know if the voting's just really even at this point or <laughs> we have two people voting. So I guess I could vote too. Give people a few more seconds. Okay, so yep, uh, a split between hitchhikers and nativists. I think that if I were to Go back to before we did this experiment, I would have guessed that uh, militaristic and nativist were probably um, the most engaging. But really, this is, uh, sorry, kind of a trick question <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of different types of engagement that we measured. And I think kind of what's most engaging really care or uh, really depends on what you care most about uh, for your project. So here's some of the statistics that um, I can go through later or that you can see when we publish the paper, if 
um, you're interested in these sorts of things. Um, but we have all these details available and you can see these in the paper when it's published. So the metric that we really cared the most about was cost per click, just because I think that was the most uh, kind of direct measure of kind of like interest and engagement, like people thought that the content of the post was you know, interesting enough that they like clicked on it to learn more. They just didn't like react to it. They like, this is interesting enough that I need to know more. And so if we look at uh, the results of the message frames, you know, militaristic science and nativist for men were kind of all in one group with protective and hitchhikers being more expensive. And then for women, um, it was a little bit more even spacing, but it's pretty similar with science, nativist, militaristic kind of in one group, and then protective and hitchhikers um, more expensive. And so you'll notice that it was also more expensive for the women than for the men. And I don't think that's, I think that has more to do with the Facebook advertising ecosystem than anything that it's just, I think more expensive to advertise for women to women that there's just more competition on their social media space. So it's just gonna cost a little bit more for the same result. So not that it's like less effective or like the, the message frame is less effective. So um, here's the other engagement data that we tracked and I have it you know, broken down both for men and for women. So I'll just kind of walk through this a little bit. So we tracked Facebook reactions, which would just be like likes or smiley faces or any of that kind of stuff that you can do. And uh, just for the reactions, like literally anything <laughs> Uh, but science generated a bunch of reactions. So just the facts didn't seem to kind of inspire people to kind of like it or whatever. Um, but any use of metaphor kind of caused people to react to it more, which we thought was pretty interesting. So you know, something with some feeling. But if we look at you know shares, so that would be somebody taking the advertisement, clicking share, so their followers could see. Uh, the more socially desirable frames, the hitchhikers and protective, had more shares than militaristic science and nativists. So, you know, again, we think this is like kind of they're more socially desirable. People want to be, you know, seen supporting these messages. And we know that, you know, hearing messages from kind of other people, your friends and your family, can be important for behavior change. So, we think that shares are pretty important. So, this is a confusing title, but this is actually page likes, not just likes, but page likes. And so, this would be somebody looking at the post and then deciding to like the Wisconsin Lakes Facebook page who helped us out with this project because they liked the content. And so this is kind of the opposite of shares where we see uh, the more controversial frames do better that, you know, th this seemed to engage some people, but this action's done in private. No one knows that you liked a page based off of this post. And so we see that, you know, this is kind of an endorsement of like, we like this, we want to see more content like this. And for the comments, again, the more controversial frames generated more conservation, or con not, con <laughs> not conservation, but conversation. Um, so more on that in a second. So uh, for the women, you know, a lot of similar patterns, but some, some like little differences. So there's a similar pattern for just reactions, you know, like any metaphor or frame other than science uh, got people to react. Shares, there's a, a similar pattern of sharing socially desirable things. Uh, for the page likes, there's less variability among the page likes and almost the opposite of men that um, you know, the science did better <laughs> than the other ones. And then for the comments, there is just little discussion generated about invasive species uh, among the women we advertise to. We don't know if the, the message freight or you know, the art wasn't inspiring or there's just less to say about this. Um, there were no differences in the comments there. But speaking of comments, so um, the controversial frames generated more or conversation, but it's not always the conversation we wanted. So if you look through this, you know, it's a lot of, you know, nativist language and, you know, like jokes <laughs> about kind of the topic. I mean, there's one like oyster size joke that I still kind of chuckle about, but, um, really not great conversation. And this is not something that I really would want my program to be associated with. And you know, for kind of this reason alone, I wouldn't use this message frame, even if I thought it was engaging because like, yes, it generated a lot of conversation, but this isn't something that we should be associated with uh, as an invasive species outreach program. But it's better on some frames. So technically science, uh, 
generated like a little less con conversation than the other frames, but this is like good productive conversation. It's sharing it with other people. It's, you know, talking about their own experience with it and further generating more conversation about this. So even if it's less conversation, this is the conversation that, you know, I would want our program to be involved with and the conversation that I'd you know, want to be seen like kind of inspiring. So those are the results of our project, kind of walking through everything. So what are some limitations? So what did we actually test? We actually tested what's most cost-effective at gaining people's attention rather than what to do once you have it. So like, I think we were very literally like the guy with the pizza sign twirling it as you drive by trying to get you to stop and buy pizza. Like <laughs> they're maybe good at getting your attention, but maybe less good at communicating that message of you know, like buying a pizza or getting you to stop, you know, and that's much different than when you have a people or a group of people that are already kind of invested in what you're saying. Um, and so you need to come up with a message that's uh, the best for inspiring them. So there are kind of two different communication goals there. And then also we know that because we use drawings and uh, an artist that somebody else probably would have kind of captured the visual essence of our message frames differently. And so if somebody, you know, a different set of three people were to draw these and operationalize these, I think the, the results could be different. So I'd be interested in seeing that if people have the money and time and want to do that. <laughs> um, but the one thing is that this would have been impossible to do with, you know, photos or something, you know, arguably more objective. So, you know, just needed to throw that out there as a limitation. And I think this is the last <laughs> limitation slide that we have. Um, I think a lot of what we learned both from the spiny water flea video and from this message testing project is that, uh, or we learned this from instances where we were you know, intentionally trying to maximize an effect size. Like I don't think that any militaristic or nativist frame is as militaristic or as nativist as the frames we used. And I'm not sure I would recommend you know, people using um, especially some of our drawings for outreach. But what we really wanted to do was you know, turn each of these you know, message frames up to 11. So that way we could maximize the effect size and measure it and see it. So you know, I think that's one frame to kind of look through our results. And I think we also uh, just want to put out there that we have a lot, I think we have a lot of external validity and that these are real world tests we were using on Facebook. Like, you know, again, people just, out in their normal Facebook day, <laughs> looking through things like this is how they would interact. Um, but these aren't with materials that we normally think would be used. Um, and our experimental design, while I think good for what we were doing, you have, I think there are more direct ways you could measure the impacts of these metaphors, but they would also kind of cost more and I think be more difficult to do. So if somebody has lots of money, <laughs> Maybe not even lots, but if somebody has more money and wants us to do it that way, I'd be interested in that too. Uh, but for $2,500 and some time, I think we did a pretty good job. So um, what does all of this mean? <laughs> so I think that uh, what we learned from this project is that you know there are differences in people taking action. So um, something that you know I think inspired Brett a little bit on this project is that he gets requests from people a lot about you know wanting to be engaging. But engaging means, you know, it's there are different kinds of engagement, <laughs> and uh, I think we should be thinking about that. And you know, cost effective is the mo the same as you know the most engaging. So really understanding what your communication goals are, so you could tailor a message to that, I think would help us all out. And you know that there are differences in these types of engagements, like page like sharing comments. So if you you know especially have an online or social media communication campaign, um, your message might impact you know or sorry, your communication goal might impact what message you want. Uh, also, people may engage with the controversial thing. So if you're you're really glued to the metrics, you might see really good engagement metrics on this controversial, controversial thing, but they might not share it, or it might not be engagement that you really like. <laughs> so um, you know, it might be better to do the thing that seems to get less uh, engagement, but has more productive conversation or is maybe a more positive message. But you know, generally, we think that uh, the message frames can impact how people feel about aquatic invasive species and the actions they take. So you know, I think this is this work is a good argument for that kind of responsible metaphor use uh, that previous researchers have made. I think you know something else actionable that we can take out of this is that I think we can really just 
I'm not that I ever really use the, the nativist message frame, but I think I have data to really suggest that people should stop using it, that there is no instance where just the nativist message frame was kind of most effective on its own. And without it, I think there was enough uh, kind of ethical arguments that you know, people shouldn't be using it, that you know, it was worth not using on its own there. But if for some reason you needed data to make that decision, I think this provides the data you would need to say, you know, there's other more effective message frames that have the same results without the ethical baggage. And the same with the militaristic. Um, plus the militaristic is, you know, it's only clearly better for men in a few instances. And you know, really in a, most instances, there's a combination of science protective and hitchhiker that can get you all of the metrics that you want. And so you don't have to use message frames that you know, either alienate part of your audience or have some unintended, unintended kind of ethical issues. So uh, my last kind of bigger picture results slide. So with this project and the Stop the Spiny project and a few other projects I've worked on, um, you know, like the introduced podcast that uh, the Wisconsin Sea Grant Communications team, Bonnie and Sydney, have done a lot of work on. You know, I think art and science in whatever medium can work together a lot for communication and research. And I think I used to be really sold on art and science for communication. And these past two projects have really kind of pushed me on how I could think about art and science for research as well and exploring some topics that um, I guess have been tougher to address just because of you know how a lot of natural scientists might think about things. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of cool opportunities here in this space uh, to help us improve you know, invasive species management. And then additionally, words matter. I, I think we've all heard that before, but this is like reinforcing that again, that I think we should be more mindful of the words we're using to talk about invasive species. So that way we're actually getting the, uh, we're having the impacts that we'd like, which leads me to my next point is that you know, we can get that information through a more scientific approach to outreach and communication. Uh, sometimes I think that, um, some outreach communication is done on, you know, like opinion, and I think this is <laughs> the best way to do it. That, um, you know, because it's outreach and communication, it's not always structured in the same way as you know a research project might be. But if we could take a little bit more, either you know, scientific approach or incorporate more evaluative thinking into this, we could, you know, get the data that we need to, you know, make data-driven decisions and you know improve our communication moving forward to you know, have the the desired impacts. So with that, I am done rambling. Um, after saying that we probably shouldn't use the militaristic metaphor <laughs> as much, I am ending with the militaristic message frame slide just because I think this is my favorite piece of art from the project. Uh, this is you know, one of the, the first drafts of the militaristic frame just because we you know, thought it'd be fun to have zebra mussels on tanks. And then we realized that that wasn't very aquatic and people might not know what's going on. <laughs> so um, we quickly scrapped this one, but I still really like it. So anyway, uh, thank you for taking some time out of your lunch hour to uh, talk in base of species messaging with us. And I am happy to answer some questions. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, I'll go ahead and read the first question in the chat. I think this is an interesting one. Um, someone asks, do you think superhero or supervillain framing might work? Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's a great approach. And I think it would be uh, something I'd really like to test kind of moving forward, uh, like superhero, supervillain kind of thing. Granted, um, I think that it might have some of the same impacts as militaristic, just maybe not quite as bad. But I've also been thinking about kind of sports teams too, as a way to kind of get that us versus them mentality without uh, evoking some of the same feelings as like a militaristic metaphor. But yeah, I'd love to test something like that. Okay, well, everybody else out there, feel free to type some questions for Tim in the chat. I'll monitor that and we'll see what we get. So while we're waiting, Tim, have you worked with that grad student artist anymore on other projects who did the I, illustrations for your study? I haven't worked with uh, Brooke anymore. I think, well, I know she's graduated and I think I've moved on to gain full employment, but if we had another opportunity to do something like this, I'd love to check back in with her and you know, see how she could help us out to do some of these drawings. Because again, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, and I think she did a really nice job of making them as similar as humanly possible you know, to make sure that your study was consistent just with the composition and like you mentioned, the colors, the types, et cetera. Yeah, I think it was, um, I don't know if it was a weird request, but I think it, it was something that's a little bit 
it was a little bit outside of the box and outside of like the normal way of operating, you know, of having to think about having all these design elements. So I think it was an interesting kind of problem for all of us to try to solve. Yeah, definitely. I think we may have another question. Oh, let's see. Somebody is asking about getting a copy of this recording. Um, what we'll do is we'll make this available on the YouTube channel for Wisconsin Sea Grant, um, but it will take a little bit of time because we'll send this out for captioning. So once we have that all packaged together, um, we'll put it on the Sea Grant YouTube channel. And then I'll announce that on our Facebook page, Twitter, if you're following us there, that's a good way to stay in touch about things like this. Um, let's see, somebody else asks, what age group do you think comics like these could most influence? So an age-related question. Probably everyone. <laughs> um, so I don't know if the like our Stop the Spiny video, maybe we were targeting it towards, well, kind of everyone. And I feel like maybe failed at doing everyone. But I think if we are good with some of our targeting, we you could probably get you know, some of these more fun animations to target everyone. But um, I would like to see us trying to maybe target some younger folks with these two, just because it just seems like it'd be a fun, really uh, a fun, interesting way to present some of this information, both you know, for the reader and for us. <laughs> I'm giving it a minute here for more questions. I guess while we're waiting, um, Tim, you talked about language issues and how words matter. Um, and I've been hearing things lately about Kind of the terminology around non-local beings as a different way to refer to invasive species. Um, this is also something that's mentioned in a recent episode of that introduced podcast that you mentioned that's all about AIS. Um, how popular is this terminology? Um, do you feel like it's a useful additional frame to get people to think about this? I'm just curious, what is your take on this? So I think the non-local beings terminology, I've really only heard it uh, talked about with uh, some of our tribal nations and partners. Um, and I haven't heard it used as much, you know, I guess, uh, among other communities, but you know, I personally like the terminology um, because it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, you know, automatically assume like that there is impact <laughs> with the non-local being terminology, like invasive already, like if you're calling something invasive, like it means that there's an impact. And I think there's a kind of connotation that if it's invasive, we should be trying to get rid of it. Where I think if you use some more neutral language, like non-local being or even non-native, um, I think it makes you think twice about whether or not, like, or what you should do about it. So yeah, I would be interested again in like kind of testing it against some of these other messages, but I would have a feeling if, you know, people thought more along those lines, um, you know, we might be a little bit mind, more mindful about some of the actions that we're taking for invasive species management. I think we may have, uh, yes, yeah, somebody comments, non-local might take the fear factor out. Yep, yeah, I think that's a, a good point, Jeannie, that, um, Invasive species do have unwanted impacts and no one wants them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, if you have an invasive species, it doesn't mean like instant lake death and the loss of everything that you want. There's a lot of factors that go into whether or not it's going to have an impact. And so, you know, maybe if we can help people not <laughs> jump to that conclusion so quickly um, and, you know, figure out like what they can do to manage this, uh, in all the different ways that we have to manage it. I think that could be helpful. All right, well, I guess if we have no other questions, and I'll just put out kind of a last call here for questions. We've got a few minutes remaining. So, oh, let's see, we may have one. Okay, uh, here's the question. I'll just read it out. Um, Matthew asks, so for doubting scientists slash ecologists who know the issue but aren't acting, any suggestions on framing? Also, how do you diffuse the humans are invasive so counter argument? Well, I am hoping that um, maybe some of this research can help people understand that you know there are different frames you can use for invasive species and they have different impacts and you know, making actual recommendations. Um, I know people that I work with that 
are less interested in some of the ethical arguments and want to see like data. And so we're hoping that you know this paper that'll hopefully um, get through the review process again here soon uh, can help you know help convince some of those people that want to see the data and you know are already maybe on board with the ethical arguments, but kind of want the data. So uh, hopefully this can help with that. In terms of the how do you diffuse the humans are invasive, you know, so and that kind of always ends conversations for me. Um, I guess I always like to talk about it in that, you know, invasive species are such a human centered, you know, construct that, you know, in a world without humans, like the species are moving around and competing and, you know, it's just happening. It's like nature, right? <laughs> um, but humans are moving things around and uh, it, something is invasive when humans move it someplace. And so, you know, I don't necessarily know that humans moving themselves places and being, you know, major ecosystem engineers <laughs> are really invasive. Like, I'm pretty sure we got ourselves everywhere that we are. Um, and I just never actually find it to be very productive to think about humans as invasive species because then it uh, deflects the focus on all of the things that we as humans can do to manage the problem. We can take preventative actions. Um, we have management strategies for things that are present. So I really kind of like to try to pivot the focus back to the things we can do. All right, well, I think maybe we can wrap it up here, um, barring any final questions. Oh, wait, there's one more. Let's see. It says, this approach seems to conflict with recent stop the spiny messaging. It's less combative. How do you suggest transitioning to the softer, less combative mentality? Yeah, I think that um, once this paper gets published, <laughs> I'd like to be a little bit more vocal about some of this. and really, you know, sorry to sound like a broken record, but present people with the data so that way they can make their own decisions on how to, you know, frame these communications. Um, that I think that, I think that a lot of scientists and professional communicators when presented with the right data um, can maybe make better data-driven decisions on some of these things. Um, but, if I have to admit, like going back five or six years, this isn't something that I really thought about. I just tried to think of catchy slogans, you know, good metaphors that people seem to like. And I think you can always, you know, find some people that agree with you <laughs> and react positively to this thing that you put together. Um, and you, you might not have, and I probably wasn't ever seeking out this research to help me communicate this a little bit better. So I hope that uh, when I get some time that we can put together some better you know, products and information for people. So that way, if they're doing their own communications, uh, they have a little bit more information to draw from rather than just trying to put together something that they you know, think is the most engaging or inspiring. Because we don't have to think about that anymore. We can know that. So I want to help people get that information. Well, great. I think we can end it here then. I don't see any other questions in the chat or the Q&A. So thanks so much, Tim, for redoing this talk. Um, with our special lunchtime lake talk. I really appreciate it. And hopefully people enjoyed this as well. Um, and as I mentioned, just keep an eye on the YouTube page um, of Wisconsin Sea Grant. And you can actually find some older lake talks on there as well. And we'll continue to add to them throughout the season. So thanks everyone for attending. And thank you, Tim, for doing this. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.